All right, so next up, we'll be hearing from uh, Joseph Picosi on some runtime polymorphism. Yes, so uh, I just have one more qu comment since I got the, got the turn. Uh, this is awesome, I think, Niels, what you're doing. Please, when the concepts are in the standard, I, I want to see good error messages out of that. I think it's great, but if I have to see you know, a, long, a long, long error message with, uh, with tag topple and all that, that would be a lot more useful that way. So I, but it's, it's great. I, I'm looking forward to, to try that. So um, uh, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a, a, a talk that, uh, that is really not my field, I think. I've never given anything like that. It's going to be more code. And uh, so uh, bear with me. The reason why I decided on this subject is that I want to know your opinion. I want to know the expert's opinion and interrupt me and tell me that uh, there's no need for that, you don't know what you're doing, uh, or this is awesome, that's fine too, but uh, I, I wanna know what you guys think. So uh, this is work uh, that um, is part of a, a bigger project. We're doing hydrodynamics uh, using Charm++, and uh, there is a new collaboration now uh, with, a, with, an, uh, with the NC State who's, uh, some of the guys are here, and we'll hear from them tomorrow, too. And uh, so a little, couple of slides on the background. Um, here is the, uh, uh, the high-level overview of what we're doing and why. There is this open source code. Um, and uh, as I said, we're doing 3D unstructured mesh uh, aerospace type uh, uh, computation of fluid dynamics at this point. Uh, nothing very interesting like this or like that, what's in the background that we do yet, but that's the goal. So um, here are uh, uh, a few things there. So uh, here are the uh, high level points of, of our philosophy. Uh, we we want to reuse everything we can. So we have a lot of libraries and we want to build everything basically from scratch so we can use as much as we can. Uh, from uh, the features of the runtime system, and uh, and we have the complete we have complete freedom in in, in how we do things, and that's part of uh, my uh, uh, better or worse kind of thinking. I wanted to learn both C plus plus and Charm plus plus when I really started this. So now there's even a little funding for it uh, recently, and uh, we're enjoying that. So. Uh, here is our very short, uh, maybe two-year immediate plan. Uh, the red stuff is what, our, uh, what we want to really concentrate on. Uh, we're putting in uh, uh, adaptive mesh refinement uh, in a distributed memory over the composition of air uh, fashion that will work with, uh, with load balancing and all that. And uh, that's under development. We have the basic logic of the algorithm done in, in serial, but we're doing it in parallel now. And uh, we're also putting in uh, uh, different hydrodynamic schemes. There are uh, some interesting details of where we're going with P refinement is, is another way of, of localizing uh, the solution uh, quality locally. And that's going to create load imbalance too. And we also uh, have a, a contract in place now with the Charm uh, Works uh, guys to help us with load balancing and uh, some of the uh, next steps here. But, uh, oh yeah, so here's a slide on, uh, on all the different, uh, maybe not all, but some of the third party libraries that we use. We use a lot of these open, feet, uh, open uh, tools. And uh, so we're not trying to write this from scratch or everything by, by ourselves. So that's just to show that. And uh, here's uh, some bullet points of where uh, the code is right now, about 60,000 uh, lines. As I said, a lot of libraries, lots of testing, and lots of continuous automated testing and, and coverage and all these things, as it should be if you want to write uh, code that you don't want to debug for, uh, for a long time. And oh, by the way, six hours debunking time for a problem, I would be happy with that. <laughs> so uh, that's why we are really making sure that this number is increasing as much as we can. And uh, okay, so here's the, uh, the, main, uh, the main subject of what I want to talk about. And uh, uh, more details in, in everything that I'm going to talk about is, is in these three files. You can go ahead and click on it 
in the slides, and then it takes you to the GitHub site. And you'll see a lot more uh, documentation and, and, and description of why uh, this is done the way it's done. So uh, here is uh, kind of a motivation for this. So uh, when we originally started doing uh, discontinuous GoLark in, uh, I kind of expected that this is going to come. Uh, there's no best method for something like uh, a discretization for hydrodynamics. And, uh, and so you want to support, support different ones. You want to be able to reuse some of it, but make it different for, for some, of the, some of the specific features and so on. This is nothing, this is nothing new. And uh, we'll, uh, we want to be able to support it in a, in a reusable and maintainable fashion. And uh, so that's what we have. And that's what I see in other projects at, at the lab, too, that uh, we have 30-year-old production codes. And uh, it's practically impossible to, to add a new hydro scheme now. And that's bad, because we can't keep up with the new methods. There's a great new methods, and we all, you can use it on a toy code, but not in the big multiphysics code. And that's not very good. So how, how can we do it better when the code is still young so that we don't get there? That's kind of motivation. Maybe I'm going to fail with that, but time will tell, I guess. So uh, here is the here's the goals uh, that we want to uh, achieve with what I'm going to uh, talk about. Is uh, so support different uh, discretization schemes, but but that uh, that could go uh, for a different example that you can be more familiar with as well. And uh, so I wanted to I wanted to make sure that if somebody comes into the the, the team then it's not really hard to add a new one, right? So that's kind of a basic requirement. And um, this scheme, let's call it scheme from now, the discretization scheme is uh, selected by the user in a sense that it's the user of the code, not the guy who's writing the code, right? So this is decided on at runtime. Reading in from some input file, I choose this or I choose that, right? So that's that information. And uh, of course, I want to be able to reuse code, non wa not wasting time uh, repeating and debugging uh, copies. And I call it switch mayhem for lack of a better term. I, I think I invented that, but maybe there's a better name for it. It's when you have um, user input like if A, then do this. If B, then do this. You see, and then you can see that goes on forever, and that's unmaintainable code. And that's just one level. Now, within if A, you have if X, do that. If, if Y, do that. Now, there's better ways of doing that, of course. And uh, one way of doing that is runtime polymorphism with, uh, with the way we're doing it in OOP for, for decades now. But uh, how does that work with Charm++ and how we can do a little bit better? That's what I wanted to explore. So here's a, here's a little longer list that's um, more like the software engineering goals. And uh, so I wanted to have a, a class that can be uh, used as a wrapper class around a char, um, char array or, pro or, or group that can hide uh, a polymorphic, a runtime polymorphic functionality behind a single uh, object. And uh, as I said, it's configured at runtime, so what it's going to dispatch to. And of course, all these nice features should be, and most importantly, the whole thing should be migratable because I want to apply it to chart arrays with migration. And I like to do this with value semantics so that um, it's, it's, uh, it's a little easier to read. And of course, avoid the siege problem, both client code as well as the implementation. And uh, I borrowed some ideas from Sean Parent, I believe was the first who presented this kind of stuff uh, where um, the, the whole runtime polymorphism implementation is confined to a sim single class, and that becomes a little more complicated, true, but the way to use it, it becomes very simple and clean, and there's no pointers or references really uh, the, in the client code, so I really like it. So some of that is uh, borrowed from there. And, um, and I believe all this stuff is really supported uh, by char++ as it is right now, but uh, uh, the way I experimented with this uh, was that uh, it, it, it still didn't help me with the switch problem on the client code. And uh, you had to have pointers and all references to, to do this. And so I want to do better if it's possible. But you guys tell me if it's better or not. And you're going to see the implementation of it, not necessarily just the client code. But this is, this is the slide on my requirements. So this is how I would like the client code to look like. So I create this object 
which I call scheme here, and I configure it with something, and this could be an enum, which discretization I want. Okay, and then after that, you can think of this as a proxy object, which, which can have a base, and it can have various child objects, type safe manner, of course, and then and it dispatches to whatever you configure to different member functions, and those are entry methods, right? So, so this is where this is how the syntax would look, syntax would look like for a broadcast. I, I like to see that uh, explicitly written out, but there are different ways of doing it, and it's just I ended up with that in the end. So that translates to this. So proxy .core something, and then um, the same thing if you want to do point to point address a single element, and then that's proxy zero. So you can see in the comment that's equivalent to that call. And uh, if you want the optional uh, CK entry options to configure and all that, you can do that too. And then that's just the equivalent of the same broadcast and then point to point. So. Uh, uh, the configure co uh, the the constructor configures the the, the underlying uh, child proxy from which the uh, from which the functionality gets specialized, and that happens here. And that's, so that's all I want to have. And then the client code doesn't know which scheme we dispatch to. So client code uh, does something like this, and I don't want to have to modify that. And I don't want switch and ifs and nothing here in the client code. Everything else has to be behind. And then, so this avoids that. And then there is no uh, reference uh, or any, there is no, there is no uh, pointers or anything. It's all, it's all nice and val value semantics. So um, here's a little bit of nomenclature. Uh, as I've been talking about, there's a base class, just like in an OOB sense. Let's call this disk proxy, and that's the proxy for the base, right? And that's my original object from which I created the proxy. So let's just think of these as uh, chart arrays. And then child inherits from base in a classical OOP sense. And that's why I'm just putting quotes. And then right now, I can configure it to three different uh, uh, special uh, discretization types. And let's just call them you know, MATCG, DIACG, DG. And these are in gray. You can see the names of the functionality that, that it hides. So the idea is that the base contains some common code that all three should use, or any number. And then there's some specific that should only go to here, because the other one doesn't need. So that's kind of obvious, I think. So the requirement. So here is uh, the actual full implementation of, of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the interface, of the public interface to how a base uh, entry method uh, is called. So um, I have several pieces, and I think finally the, the full puzzle will, will fit together by the end of the slides. Uh, so I apologize that it doesn't fit everything on one slide. But so just ignore shame ski base for now. And uh, so here's the implementation of the call to a, uh, to a broadcast call to the member function cord. And every, everything is all uh, should be generic, because I don't even want to modify this implementation if there is a new member function added. Right? So uh, all, of it, all of it will be uh, uh, variadic uh, parameter packs, right? and then perfect forwarding of the arguments. So, but this is really the, the line that we, use, that we write now. But I want to be able to use that interface that I had on other slides. So that's the implementation. And so I have two, because this is the point to point, the element, the addressing a single element. And then all this synthetic sugar is just needed to do sphene so that the compiler can choose the right overload. But otherwise, this is the line that does the real thing. And this is the line that addresses. So that's um, straightforward, I, I believe, at this point. Now, uh, here is how it looks the same thing, but now for a child uh, member function entry method call. And uh, the difference is uh, that, uh, remember now, those, uh, those child types could be different. So now uh, I, dec I, I decided to store that type in a, in a boost variant, which is a type safe union. It can store one type and only that type only, whatever is configured for. And uh, now I want to write uh, 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 a compile time uh, dispatch, basically, to the right type when I, when I invoke this call. 
And uh, boost variant uh, has been around, and uh, STD variant will be the equivalent in C17, which you can already use. I haven't tried with that, but I, I see no problem uh, switching to that anytime. So, so what the, the what the similar what the same call looks like for for a child member function for a broadcast uh, is that we, I apply apply visitor on uh, the variant and I uh, and the, and the variant is proxy and I'll show you later how that's defined. That's known by the by the class and then call DT is a functor that that helps uh, unpacking my uh, function arguments. And I'll show you how that's done later. So I'm kind of going from the outside, from client code to the, to the lowest level details here. So that's the apply visitor call that's equivalent to the, to the broadcast call of the member function. And uh, the equivalent one, again, with Sfine choosing the right overload, depending on what we're doing, is when you want to do address a single element of the array. And uh, that's done in a very similar way, but two steps. First, I have to dereference the the proxy with the operator square brackets, so I address a single element, and then I call the member function on it, passing all the arguments. So the last one is very similar to this, right? But first I need to do, I need to, so this is a double, this is a two steps. And so for the first one, I, 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 I'm aware, I, I didn't tell you what element is, right? I'll get to that later. But um, so element does this operator square bracket on X, it returns something, and then on that something, which is a variant again, because the type has to be the, the right type, depending on which child uh, proxy I'm talking about. And then I, I apply on this again an apply visitor. Now you can imagine uh, there is an apply visitor uh, behind that, that call too. So in a sense, it's similar to the, to the base class call, but uh, it's a little more complicated because, it, because of the dispatch has to be done. So, uh, what I haven't uh, talked about yet is how this functor should look like. That call DT, which is called both, both, uh, both uh, places here, that looks like this. And uh, this is a little more complicated in reality, and I'll show you the other half of the problem. I, I, uh, I wrote this first in a bigger class that can do this, and uh, I realized that there was a lot of stuff that was repeating, and the other one didn't have to be uh, more, uh, so one was the same, a lot of the stuff was not the same, so I just separated the two, so when I have to add the new member function call, or uh, I, when I add a new entry method, then I just, uh, I only have to modify as little code as possible, so even easing the work on the potential future developers or myself, when I have to add a new entry method to do this. So um, here's how it looks, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of this is, again, uh, it's just uh, template and syntactic sugar, I think. Uh, the interesting thing is here, again, that's really what we do now. Uh, and then, uh, so P is the proxy, and DT is the entry method call, and then I forward all the arguments that's coming in. So I'm going to call this invoke uh, from this base, and I'll show you the base later. I believe it's on the next slide. And, uh, and so this is the one, this is the, uh, the one that, that I use with apply visitor uh, right here, both here and here, that's the call DT. So um, uh, what I, okay, so here's the part where uh, um, I define a free function for uh, how to dereference the element. So that is, as I said, that's also an apply visitor. It's a, it's a, it's a static uh, compile time um, dispatch, basically. And uh, I want to know, uh, so what this takes is, is, a, is a functor that uh, takes this x, which is the uh, array element index, and the proxy. And uh, that's what basically does the, uh, the uh, applying the operator square bracket. And the way it does, it, it applies this functor on it, which defines uh, a templated operator function call. And uh, the way this, uh, this is written is that it can work with arbitrary types. So none of this code changes if you want to add a new discretization scheme and a new dispatch to a child, to a fourth one. And then um, 
so you see that uh, this is the only interesting thing that this whole function does, right? The rest of it is just magic, right? So this is what we do now. So p uh, and then the reference x and then return that proxy. But that proxy is a different type depending on the child. And so that's why it has to be templated. Yes. And uh, what I have, so now we're going even one more step uh, below, um, one more step even deeper. So I'm, I'm going back here for a little bit to show you that's where we are. So scheme base is what I haven't uh, talked about yet. And now we're going down uh, to that, to that part, uh, what functionality that uh, is implemented, uh, that implements. Okay. So, um, so this is the base class where our scheme uh, um, interface class inherits from. And this, this is done uh, in, in this scheme and scheme base because um, I wanted to reuse some of the common function functionality from it, of course. I don't want to repeat code. So uh, this is the type and the state of this, um, of the scheme base. So here is actually um, the data that in this whole class that I'm talking about is uh, the contains. So we have, a, we have, first of all, let me start from the bottom. We have uh, our usual uh, C proxy discretization, which is my base class proxy. And then I have a variant that stores one particular configuration for a different type in a variant, whatever it was configured for, the child. And then proxy, is def that type is defined here. So that's just a boost variance, but it could be a std variant too. And right now it has these three different proxy types. And then I also need to have something similar for the element for dereferencing the, the element ad addressing for the point-to-point -point communication call. And uh, I'm just reading it out from uh, what Charm++ provides for those types. And uh, so uh, you can see adding a new one uh, amounts to just adding a fourth one here and adding a fourth one here too. And everything else stays the same. So that was the type, and this, that's, that's what I call the state, and this is the types in here, the internal types. And uh, that's the constructor. And uh, so here's how you configure the class. The scheme type is just an enum. So that, that, that comes from user input. I want this, or DG, or CG, or whatever discretization I want. And then that's the full implementation of it. I just took it out completely. There's nothing more to it. So here's a little if else, but it's pretty obvious what to do when you want to extend this class. You just add the new one, and it's not that complicated. So what happens, what's interesting here is that um, I want to bind the, the, the base to the child so that they always migrate together, because I want to dereference uh, the base state from the child, right? So I want to have that available always when it's only, also when it's migrated. And uh, that's why that's, that's bound to it. So, and, uh, and this whole class is somewhat partial uh, as it's written because um, I, really, I really didn't even want to include this. This is just maybe too much detail. What this does is that it stores a tuple with all the various arguments that could be passed to an arbitrary member function, which could be an arbitrary number of parameters with arbitrary types. And what this does, this is a call, and it uses the CRTP curiously recurring template pattern to index into its base, or uh, this is a base to the child. And so, and here's the invoke that I had several, several slides earlier. I don't know if you remember. I don't think I, I remember already what it was. But uh, what this whole thing does is that it helps uh, going through the tuple one by one and all the arguments in lockstep in a type safe manner and to pass the right amount of arguments and the right arguments, the right types of arguments to arbitrary uh, entry method calls. And uh, when I wrote this, I was happy, okay, this works. Uh, it's complicated, but uh, as long as it's hidden from everybody else and it's documented well so I can remember a month later, then it's okay, I'm fine with it. But then uh, it doesn't migrate because it's so it's, uh, there is this particular feature of a boost variant as well as std variant that, uh, well, it, uh, char so charm, when it migrates, so I send it in uh, in the sending side and the receiving side, you guys call the default constructor. 
and uh, that's fine, but that will always default to the first type. And uh, I put in the second type, and then always the first type comes in, which is wrong. Like, that's not what I configured for. So the solution is you got to send the type across the network. And I did not know how to do that first. <laughs> so I can send a volume across the network, but a type, I'm not sure. So tuples again. It's not that complicated in the end. It can be done. So um, here is the, uh, what is this? Uh, yeah, scheme and scheme base, right? Scheme has no state at all. Everything is in scheme base, what I just recently showed. So it has two proxies, and one is a variant. The normal proxy is not a, it's not a big deal. You guys uh, do that for us already. Uh, the variant is the funny thing, because that can have different, um, different types. And I want to make sure it's the right type that comes out on the other end. And here's how that looks like, these three lines. As I said, the base is, is trivial. Um, the, the child. The polymorphic child it looks like this. This capital variant, I'm going to show you next how that's implemented, but that's the client code for, for sending the type across the network. And the type can be these three types, right? One of them in which the variant is configured for. This proxy is the one that has, that has been configured. And then, so if I create this intermediate V, and then I pop this, and then I use this v.get to get the right uh, type out of it. So these three lines instead of just one. It's not that bad after all, as uh, long as it does the right thing. So now how does this variant, capital variant, uh, look like? That, um, uh, so <laughs> it may be a lot of code again. Uh, the, the, let me just tell you the, the underlying idea is tuples. So, uh, this is the state. I have an index which helps me index into the type list, and that fills at runtime. And the variant, uh, that's an internal variant that can hold the variant that I want to send. And the tuple is configured with the same types, but it's going to hold all the types, but only one field, the one I want to send. And variant, this variant and tuple and index, all three together will determine what is the variant is configured for. And uh, I use boost uh, meta programming to uh, run a, a, compile, a compile time for loop to evaluate, to, to do a loop over, to visit all the types and then find out which one is configured for. And that's what this line does. Otherwise, I have to send the index, the tuple, um, uh, as well. And uh, here, and this this uses set val and get val. This is at the sending and receiving end. Uh, send the other way around. So get val has to get the volume first, send it across as, a, as the index, and the other one queries it. And the implementation for those two guys, get val and set val, are here. That is uh, using uh, TK. You can imagine this is std get. So it's the normal standard algorithm. Uh, but uh, addressing a type on a tuple, and uh, that is the only feature here that requires C++ 14. And the reason why I use my own, because I don't want to make that change yet. It's C++ 11 at this point. I just took over the implementation, what it was for C++ 14, for a, a type-based lookup for, uh, for the tuple. So that's what this needs to get the volume out of uh, from the right position in the tuple, and that's uh, this is this is the functor that's used to um, to set um, to set the volume before sending. And the way that does that that works is that it uh, it matches the right counter, which is queried here in the constructor uh, before here. Uh, there is an input variant that sets, that calls a standard member function, which tells me which is the index that the type is configured for. Is that? That's the end of it. So uh, I'll, th this is it. It's, I, I think it's fairly, it became kind of complicated and ugly. Uh, I, I'm still happy with the functionality, but I, I don't like to um, scare people with that too much. But uh, you guys uh, are an exception. <laughs> so, uh, so here is the, the exactly the same uh, requirement slide again. So here is how I can use this. 
And I like it because uh, it simplifies the client code. It fulfills all this stuff, so that's nice. And that's all um, a person who wants to use it needs to know, I believe, as long as the rest is documented, I think. So here's the motivation slide again. And uh, well, that's what I'm kind of trying to solve, not to uh, write, um, so, it's these discretization types, but it could be others, other problems and other things in other codes where they are just so pervasive and, uh, well, we'll try to do something about it. Time will tell because we're not in 30 years yet, so we'll see what kind of trouble we get into with this. It's probably going to be not much better than what it is now, so. But it was fun working on it, so, and that's all that matters. So, um, I believe it's better. I don't know. You guys tell me. And uh, this really works. I didn't really take out too much stuff. Uh, I encourage you to look, uh, click, at the, click on the links, and then you'll see that really, I have more member functions, obviously, for these classes. But other than that, everything is just repeating. So, and uh, all of this is generic. It's very simple to add a new type to it. So that was the goal. That was one of the goals. And uh, well, it works, I think. So that's the conclusion. Uh, some of this is black magic, I think, and it took me some time too to, uh, to figure it out. And I'm not even sure if that's all much better. But uh, as long as it's documented and it, it works as it should be, then I think it's maybe useful. Thank you. You were, you were probably expecting my hand up. Uh, that's really neat, actually. I like that. Um, so, so we opted for setting those kinds of things at compile time. Uh, that's a which, little different problem, probably easier. Right, right. So I'm just saying, in, in contrast, um, in terms of the ugliness, I think I, we should talk. I have some ideas on how you can do the boost variant pupping, I think, better. The, uh, um, OK. Yeah, I, I think it better in a sense that well, I don't have to send three objects instead of just less yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, sure but that's... so we should talk about that. But yeah, I think this this is actually really nice in terms of when you're dealing. Like I said, we we read things in. We have an uh, as our CPP file for our executables defines, let's say, our numerical flux or our time integrator and these kinds of things. And so if you wanted to read these things from an input file, I think this is a, a really nice implementation of that. Read these things from the input file. What do you mean? Like you, you were setting the the that you're using continuous Galerkin or discontinuous Galerkin. You're that's reading that. That's an enum, right? So that's what you read from the input file. Right. What is right, the right. user? What does the user want to use at this for this run? Right. And and so we compile an executable specifically for these target things. Um, that's another way of doing so, it. In so, which case, there's no problem because it's always right. Different. Well, if you want to reuse the code, then you still want to write the same yes. path that executes, but then you just have to dispatch either by hand or by something like this, which is a lot yeah. uglier to do, but at least. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, it's really it's just, the complexity goes to deeper or not. That's yeah. Really so, so I think that this actually really nicely solves the reading from the input file problem. Well, I'm glad you like it. And if you if we let if you let you two, then I think it'll go on back and forth until we are in the break. So uh, if there are questions from others, and I think we should let you two. Okay, so there is a question back there, and we should move to the uh, next talk. Do, do I have time for a question? I think um, so. Yeah. Yes. So uh, one of the concerns I have is that. HPC systems tend to have old compilers, even old C++11 compilers, where the optimizers are not great. And looking through CRTP and StudVisit or BoostVisit is, is modern optimizers do a pretty good job of this, uh, but old optimizers, especially like GCC4, GCC5, uh, are not great about this. So I'm curious if you've seen uh, performance differences under the different compilers you've tested for. Uh, no, I don't see differences, and the oldest compiler we test is 4.8 GCC, which is pretty old. I, I don't see any problem with it. So I think all the XP machines now are GCC 7. Oh, great. So 
Yeah, so I don't think the only, the only reason why I'm still sticking to C11 was uh, what is the machine at organ? Uh, Mira. That's the only one where it's only Clang that can do C11 and plus, not even higher than that, I think. But I, I think we're at a point of, I just, I just like the new features in 14 and 17 that I, just going to. I'm not saying you should yeah. use them. I, You're um, right. Though. You know, if I had my way, everyone would be using C17. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the optimizers get better and better over time. Uh, but these things, these uh, features in particular, have been notorious for um, haranguing optimizers. So I was just curious. Yeah, actually, uh, not particularly with this code, but in general, with other code around this stuff that I'm talking about is what I've seen problems actually with the Intel compiler. That's a little bit more behind Clang and GNU. Uh, yeah, but even that is no problem with this. So. Right, like here, you're, you're, you're dispatching on the member function you're calling. You're not dispatching inside client code. So all of the work is inside call D, is inside DT, as opposed to that you, if you were dealing with a variant inside DT and invoking that a lot, I think it'd be much more of an issue. But here, it, I, think, I think the thing you can get away, the reason you can get away with something here is because you don't have, you're not doing it a lot. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I forgot to mention that this is at a relatively high level. So DT is not a good example because it's just computing the, the, the size of the time step. That's not much work. But the same thing happen, happens for RHS, right? That's the right-hand side. That's 90% of my work. And uh, that's, just a, that's just a dispatch for the member function. And then what's heavy is, in, is, is inside the right-hand side, which is go through loop root through all the, all the cells in a given chunk and compute all the integrals and all that. So compared to that, what this does is most likely negligible. Didn't measure it. That's the caveat, though. But you're right. It, this is a good, uh, good point.